What scientists now realized was that the arrangement of the atoms, the way they were connected together, was crucial. And by studying the element carbon, they made one of chemistry's great breakthroughs. In 1796, Yorkshire chemist Smithson Tennant was investigating what diamonds were made of when he decided to burn one. Now, he used sunlight and a magnifying lens to heat the diamond, but I'm going to speed things up and use a glass-blowing torch, and I have some liquid oxygen. Now, if I hold this then in the flame and heat it up... And there we have it, whizzing around. That's beautiful. Bubbles coming off were collected by Smith's and Tennant. They're pure carbon dioxide. Now, he knew that he'd started with just two ingredients, diamond and oxygen. And what he produced was a gas made up of just carbon and oxygen. So he knew that diamond had to be carbon. Now, that's almost disappeared. It's gone. That diamond doesn't exist anymore. It's in the air that I'm breathing. It's turned into carbon dioxide. So, unfortunately, diamonds aren't forever. Tennant's revelation left scientists with a conundrum. They knew carbon already as graphite, one of the softest elements on the planet. So how could it be the same element as the hardest substance, diamond? What was carbon's secret? At the end of the 18th century, Tennant didn't yet know that elements were made of atoms, so he was unable to find the answer. It will be another half century before a young Scotsman called Archibald Scott Cooper took up the challenge. Cooper was a rising star in chemistry. In 1856, when he was 27, he went to Paris to work with one of the eminent chemists of the day, Charles Adolphe Wurtz. Cooper was fascinated by the way carbon atoms combined with other atoms. And he came up with the idea of bonds, links between the atoms to explain how the elements join with each other. This is Cooper's paper, written in June 1858. The ideas in here would spark a revolution in the way we interpret chemistry. And this is Cooper's picture of the way the atoms are connected. The C stands for carbon and the H for hydrogen. And these lines are Cooper's bonds that explain how he thought the atoms all joined together. And this is the real genius. Somehow, Cooper realized that carbon doesn't just have one link, but four. Because of its four bonds, it can attach with different strengths to other carbon atoms. That's why it can exist in two extreme forms. In diamond, all four bonds are connected to other carbon atoms in three dimensions. That's why diamond is so hard. But in graphite, only three of the bonds are connected to other carbon atoms in a single plane, making the connections weaker, which is why graphite is a much softer material. Carbon's four bonds give it another extraordinary property. Imagine I'm a carbon atom. I can use one hand to link to another atom and my other hand to a link to a second, leaving my feet free to make more links. So carbon's four bonds means it can combine with lots of other atoms. It can form rings and long chains, something that makes it rare amongst the elements. Carbon. It has us in its nurturing grasp from our birth to our death. It's found in everything from a whale's backbone to the smallest virus. 
carbon is in DNA, in cellulose, fat, sugar. Daily, each of us takes in 300 grams of it. Earth's carbon, like most other elements, was ejected from dying stars, which means we're all made of stardust. Cooper had solved a fundamental puzzle. He'd explained why carbon could be found in so many compounds, why it made up so much of the natural world. Now he just had to publish his findings to claim the credit. But a German chemist, Friedrich Kekulé, had hit upon exactly the same idea. Kekulé spent time studying in London, and it was apparently whilst on a London bus that he claimed he'd had a flash of inspiration. Most of us sit on the bus dreaming about Leeds United, what we're going to have for supper when we get home, or what's on the telly. But Kekulé claimed he dreamt of whirling atoms embracing in a giddy dance. He saw them uniting into chains, pulling more atoms together. Suddenly, the conductor shouted, Clapham! And Kekulé came to, with new ideas of structure formed in his mind. Kekulé raced to get his concept into print. Cooper's boss had been slow to get his paper published. So Kekulé took all the credit. And in science, there's no prize for second place. Despite having been the first to unravel carbon secrets, Cooper got none of the glory. When he discovered that his boss, Adolf Vorts, had somehow delayed in sending his paper, he flew into a rage at Vorts, who promptly expelled him from the lab. From there, he disappeared completely from chemical history. No scientific papers, no letters to journals, no experiments, nothing. Cooper missed out on his chance for recognition and soon after lost his mind. He would spend years in an asylum. But once Carbon's secrets had been revealed, a world of opportunity beckoned for many others. There are more known compounds of carbon than of any other element. So understanding how it could combine gave us the means of creating compounds by design. Suddenly, it seems everyone was manipulating the elements. So it wasn't long before industry was cashing in on this newfound certainty and modern industrial chemistry was born. Combining elements into new compounds would not only offer the prospect of building fortunes, science's mastery of carbon chemistry began to shape our lives. It's hard to imagine a world without plastics today. One invented in 1907 had the catchy title of polyoxybenzylmethylenglycolanhydride, better known as Bakelite. It soon appeared almost everywhere. The wonder material could be molded into a myriad of different shapes. New discoveries came thick and fast. In the 1930s, American chemist Wallace Carruthers tapped into a mass market. He converted carbon chemistry into cash when he invented what's in here. It looks a bit like a cocktail, at the bottom is a carbon chain, hexamethylenediamine. That's hexa for hexagon, six carbon atoms. And floating above it is another carbon chain, decanediol dichloride. And on the boundary between the two chemicals, they're reacting together to form bonds. So if I pull out this glass rod, you can see I make a string which is more and more of the chemicals bonding together into very long chains. I'm going to make use of this device as a spinning wheel. 
with just a few elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen, found in coal, water and air, Carruthers had designed his very own unique fibre. It could be spun as fine as a spider's web, but had the strength of steel. It was called nylon. When nylon stockings first went on sale in America, the entire stock of five million was sold in a day. Nylon began a revolution in synthetic chemistry, but Carruthers didn't live to see its success. He suffered from depression, and just three weeks after the basic patent for nylon had been filed, at the age of 41, he committed suicide by slipping a carbon compound, potassium cyanide, into his drink. Nylon became a global phenomenon. Progress appeared unstoppable. But inevitably, perhaps, our increasing control of the elements brought new dilemmas. The automobile was just 35 years old when Thomas Midgley Jr., an engineer with General Motors, found a chemical remedy to help its engine run smoothly and more efficiently. Cars at that time had terrible trouble with their engines knocking and misfiring. Midgley had tried to solve this by experimenting, it said, with everything from butter and camphor to ethyl acetate and aluminium chloride. Success finally came with a lead compound, tetraethyl lead, known as TEL. It worked brilliantly, nothing else came close. By the 1970s, the US alone was adding around 200,000 tonnes of lead to its petrol every year. But research was emerging to suggest that it was causing harm, both to humans and the environment. In 1983, a royal commission questioned whether any part of the Earth's surface or any form of life remains uncontaminated. Midgley's compound began to be phased out. Today, almost all of the world's petrol supplies are unleaded. Lead. The alchemists thought it was the oldest metal. The Romans were the first to use it on a large scale. It's so stable that Roman lead pipes still survive to this day. Our word plumbing comes from the Latin word for lead, plumbum. Lead is toxic to humans as it deactivates the enzymes that make haemoglobin in blood. Although no longer used in petrol, much of the lead produced each year still ends up in cars, in batteries. Lead may have forced scientists to face difficult questions, but it didn't stop them forging ahead in their bid to control and manipulate the natural world. And their work with one group of elements was to spark a revolutionary idea, the prospect of creating new man-made elements. <laughs> 